to Blue. My name is Mathieu Sony. You can also find me on Twitter at ScoobyMTL. Here's just a little bit about me. Um, I specialize in adversary detection and uh, threat hunting. I'm also a DEF CON Blue Team volunteer since last year uh, at its creation. Um, at this point of the talk, you might already wonder, is this guy mentally challenged or does he have an accent? Well, according to my doctor, it's because I'm French Canadian and I speak like this. So you'll, <laughs> so you'll probably notice that I will or not pronounce H's in front of word and S's uh, at the end of words, or I might add them where they don't belong. Don't worry. Um, and Canadian, well, in general, we're uh, nice people until we talk about hockey. So here's the agenda for today. So we're going to go over an, uh, an overview of Bloodhound, uh, some basic usage of Bloodhound. Then I'm going to go through an introduction of the Cypher query language. And then we're going to use that knowledge to destroy attack paths. And then we're going to talk about reporting and automation. By show of hands, except you two, uh, <laughs> who actually used Bloodhound before? Okay, a lot of people who actually build their own Cypher query before. Hola. <laughs> you did. Okay. Um, defenders think in list, attackers think in graph. As long as this is true, attackers wins. This is a very famous quote from John Lambert that you probably heard. It's also the title of one of his blog posts. Um, so when an adversary lands in your network, it does not land in a list, it lands in a graph, which is a complex set of relationship between objects. Bloodhound is one of the tools that can actually help you uh, visualize the graph and turn the table in your favor as a defender. So what do we talk about when, you, when we talk about list? Well, this is a good example. A list of assets, a list of server names, a list of groups, a list of serial number, which is extremely useful in InfoSec. And when you dig down, you have more lists, a list of open ports, install software, compliance box, so on and so forth. While all, what all of those lists won't tell you that a graph will is how are those things actually connected together? In other words, what are the relationship that exist that you know of, and especially that you do not know of, between all of your assets? What is a graph? Well, a graph is not a security ter a concept per se. It can be used in everyday life, like in this example. So you and Alexis are in a restaurant. Comes along Taylor and Jordan. You become infatuated with Jordan, and you're going to leverage a set of relationship in order to get what you want. So you're going to leverage your family relationship with Alexis, which is a coworker of Taylor, which is a friend of Jordan. And with that, you're going to find Jordan phone's number. Yay! And by the icon I used for that phone number, you can guess roughly how old I am. <laughs> I also hope that you noticed and you appreciate that all the names and relationship are gender neutral. Put a lot of effort into that. Now in Active Directory, this is how it actually translates. An attacker will land on your network, maybe by using spear phishing or password spraying or whatever. And from that user, he might have admin to his own laptop. Very bad infosec practice, but it does happen way more than we want to admit it. Then from that laptop, Maybe that user can RDP to a terminal server, for example, and depending on the size of your organization, there might be hundreds, if not thousands, of people connected to that machine. And one of these uh, users who has a session has a little crown because it belongs to a group, a high-value group, such as domain admin. Um, in this presentation, I'll use domain admin or high-value group almost interchangeably, but uh, bear in mind that there's more uh, groups than just domain admins that are of high interest. Now we're going to go over an overview of Bloodhound. I might go a bit fast because almost everybody raised their hand. But what is Bloodhound? Bloodhound used graph theory to reveal the hidden and often unintended, uh, unintended relationship with an active directory. And both red uh, defenders and attacker can use those attack paths, uh, defenders to break them, and of course, attackers to exploit them. Here's a very quick history about Bloodhound. It was released at DEF CON uh, 24 in a call, call uh, Six Degree of Domain Admin. Uh, here's the link to the presentation. If you haven't seen it, you will actually see Rowan unlock his password manager and put the repo live. Uh, I was personally uh, introduced to Bloodhound a year after that at Black Hat 2017 in a talk called 
the Industrial Revolution of Lateral Movement from Tal Mahar and Tal Berry, where they explain how you can export the JSON path and then use uh, some PowerShell script in order to get the credential automatically. Uh, last year at Black Hat uh, 2018, uh, the team released Bloodhound 2.0 uh, at Arsenal, and it is developed by Waldo, Captain Jesus, and Armjoy, who uh, are in the room. <laughs> and uh, they all work for Spectre Ops. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with those names. So what does Bloodhound do exactly? Well, it does three very simple things. It queries Active Directory, it imports the information in Neo4j backend database, and then it shows relationship between objects using a GUI. So why should you use Bloodhound? Well, for Red Team, uh, you can use the UI to build attack path offline, and this will reduce the, a lot the noise on the network. When you're uh, querying the network, every time you jump on a box, if you need to rescan the network, you're gonna do that a lot of time, especially in large network, and when you're running Bloodhound, you'll touch the machine two times if I'm not wrong. For blue teamers, well, we can qu use the query that, um, that I'll show you uh, to find the paths that give attack paths or, or route to uh, high value targets to the most people in your organization. And then you can uh, break those paths and you can actually test the effect of a remediation directly in the graph before you go out and tell your sysadmin to do any modification. And that's what we're going to talk about. So now let's go over the basic. Uh, or what I like to call the first steps. So first of all, you'll need ingester. Uh, there's three main ingester for Bloodhound. There's Sharphound, which is a C-sharp executable. There's Invoke Bloodhound, that is a PowerShell that loads uh, Sharphound reflectively. And there is Python, uh, Bloodhound Python, which is obviously a Python script that you can run also on Linux. So if you land on the Linux box, you can get all the goodness from Bloodhound from there. Um, on the right side of the screen, you can see a few collection methods that uh, you might find useful, um, or dash C for short, all. But be careful that all does not include logged on, because in Windows 10, 10th anniversary and uh, Windows 2016 server, you need to be local admin in order to list the session. Then there's also the DC only um, setting that will do a lot less noise on the network. As Defender, we don't really care about the noise, but it's still good to run it in order to see if your detection will catch it if it does less noise. Then there's the max loop time. Uh, that goes end to end with the session loop. By default, Bloodhound will run session for, will try to get the session for two hours. As Defender, you probably want to run it a lot longer because if you run it two hours during the day, uh, you'll catch all your user activity, but a lot of admin tasks are run only at night. So you can run it for 24 hours, 48 hours, and you should also shift when you're running it from time to time. Don't always run it Monday, Tuesday. Run it also sometimes on the weekend because you might have some administrative tasks that runs only on weekends. Uh, then there's uh, search forest if you have multiple forest and uh, sharp and dash H, or you can go directly in the code to get all of the other switches. It has happened in the past that the L file was not exactly as the uh, new comments. Just saying. <laughs> Now it's time to go through a little demo or a tour of the GUI. Uh, and please, uh, Andy and Rowan, don't slow down the group. If you have questions, wait until the end. We can do a one-on-one. -on -one. Just mirror, so it's going to be, whoops, wrong screen. OK. Um, so this is the screen that you see when you log in uh, Bloodhound. So on the right side, you have the domain admin groups. And on the left, you have all of your admins. If you click here, you get uh, your database information, some node information, and some queries. Most people uh, usually run the second query here, find shortest path to domain admin. So that's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to query our database. And while the little buggy does this thing, we're going to continue our tour down below here are the custom queries. You can click on the little pen here in order to uh, edit the query. I will give you a link with all of the query that you see down there that you can just paste there. Um, and here it is. So from here, you can uh, select any objects. It's gonna bring the information about that node. If you right click, you have a few things that you can do. Mark has owned uh, or edit the node. Here you'll see all the information about the node. You can also add some properties. Um, another interesting thing you can set as a starting node, and then you can use a little uh, highway here 
in order to do just like in Google Maps. So from this user, do we have a path to domain admins and it's autocomplete? It's great. Um, and then you see the path from that user. Here you can just come back to the previous view. Um, so let's continue the tour. So here you can export the graph as we talked about in JSON format or in um, a, an image. Uh, you saw it took a few minutes, but my database is very small. If you have a very large database, it can take a few hours to generate that graph. So you don't want to generate the graph every time you want to show it to someone in your organization. Here you can import your graph, uh, change the layout, upload data. And here, uh, settings, there's a few interesting things. Query debug mode, very important for us when you want to learn uh, Cypher. It's going to show you the query that is run every time uh, in the bar here, so you can cut and paste. And probably the most important part of Bloodhound, uh, it's the dark theme or the dark mode. Uh, and by the way, every time I say dark mode in this presentation, there's a fairy that is born. Why fairy? Because I have two daughters and they love fairies. <laughs> okay, some, let's, let's go over some things that are maybe less known in Bloodhound. First of all, uh, when you have an edge like this, you can right click, get some help. So if you don't know how to abuse and execute DCOM link, you can go here in abuse information and you're gonna see actually what can be, uh, how you can leverage that. Some OPSEC configuration and also some reference about this attack. Um, you can use the control key in order to toggle on or off the label. So depending with who you're sharing your graph or how busy the graph is, you might or not want to use that. Uh, there is the command control I that uh, will bring the console. Uh, so if there's anything that the console wants to tell you or the, the backend database, that's where you're gonna actually see things. Um, and finally, uh, yeah, here also you have, well here you see that you have user Little less known, uh, you can also search for GPO using GPO colon. You can search for OU, and you can also search for domain uh, that, that were queried. I told you to wait until the end, guys. <laughs> this, is, this is not nice. Um, where was I? Um, Where was? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, the GPO, the no, no, no. Oh, yeah, there's also another uh, word, uh, key stroke that you can use. It's the space bar. There. So it brings the spotlight. So this will show you all of the um, elements in your graph. And you can click on any graph. It's going to zoom in and it's going to bring the node information. Um, another key that is not very well known, and I think it's the last key that I have to show you, is uh, command R. So that will uh, log you out, refresh, log you back in, and then you'll have your new uh, interface just reloaded. Okay, so let's continue. So as I mentioned, whoops. That's the first ferry of the talk. Uh, just have a little problem with my, just a second. Uh, Jesus. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So here's the first ferry of the talk because we talked about the dark team. Um, now some undocumented feature. I said they were undocumented, uh, so I've documented them. So now they are half documented. <laughs> Um, the, so the graph database, so behind uh, Bloodhound, there's a new 4 g database, I, as I mentioned. You can delete, uh, download the community edition at that link, and you'll start that just like you would start any other Linux service using the start command. Then uh, you can log into the web console using uh, port 7474, and some of you might wonder why use the um, web console when you have a, a GUI. Well, there's a few reasons for that. Dude, I told you to wait until the end. Where's, where's, the, where's the keyboard? Where's the, where's the mouse? Jesus Christ. Can I? I'm, I'm, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So yeah, uh, graph database. So one of the reasons why to use the web UI instead of the console is that if you make a mistake, you'll know right away instead of the little doggy running forever. So here, for example, I put the equal sign instead of a, a semicolon and the interface is telling me. When I fix my query, uh, I get the actual result. Um, you can also return properties where that you cannot do in the graph user uh, in the GUI, in the Bloodhound GUI. And also, well, the web console, as you can see, has a dark team, which bring us our second ferry of the talk. Now that we've done the tour of the tool, we're gonna go into Cypher, or what I like to call learning to run. So here's the basic about Cypher. First of all, you'll need a match statement to say what you wanna actually get from, um, from your query. You'll need some objects. So here we're defining a variable u as a user. And if you want to access any properties of that object, you can use user.name. You'll also need some relationship, which is dash dash and a pointing arrow in the direction that you want. And if you want to specify the type of relationship, you can put it in bracket. Then you'll probably want to do some uh, path finding. So here you can use shortest path or all shortest paths uh, and specify the number of ops between two objects. Then you can use where to make uh, filtering. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and then uh, you can use return to return information uh, that you want to see, if you want to return a path or if you want to return uh, some properties. <laughs> it's a bit too hot. Uh, if, if you bring me a cold one, I'll drink it. Filtering. There's two ways to do filter. Uh, you can use explicit method or you can use the where clause. So here's an example of the explicit one. So here we're looking for a group name that is exactly domain user at testlab.local and a second group that we define as M, which is domain admin at testlab.local and we want to find the shortest path between the first group and the second group and return the path. We can do that using a where clause and here how you do that. So shortest path N group M group where N name starts with domain user and M name contains domain ADM. When we run those two query, uh, or here are the query side by side, sorry. When you run those query, not surprisingly, they give the same result. So you might wonder why use one instead of the other. Well, first of all, there's the speed. It is a lot faster to use explicit versus aware clause. Bear in mind, again, my database is very small, so the speed difference is not huge, but in a larger database, you might see better result or bigger difference. Um, you, it's better to use where clause if you have multiple domain though because you don't want to rewrite all your query or if you're a consultant you don't want to rewrite your query for every domain or engagement that you're doing. Uh, using the web GUI, the, yeah, the web console, sorry, uh, will also show you how you can improve your Cypher query and when you can improve it you'll see those little exclamation box uh, beside the line. When you click on them you'll get the information and then you can actually change your, um, your query. So here you'll see the fixed query and the little explanation points are, have disappeared. Here are the two queries side by side. So if you're looking at those query, you'll see that the difference between them is that actually in the first one, we are declaring our variable and then doing the shortest path. Whereas in the second one, we're doing the shortest path and we're declaring our variable right inside that function, which is now the preferred way for Cypher to build your query. It's now time for pro tip number one of the talk, explain and profile. If you wanna know how, how stressful those, your query are gonna be against your database, you can append the word explain that will do the execution plan but will not run the statement or the word profile which actually will run the statement and you'll see exactly which operator is taking uh, most of the time. So here is a, just a query that touch every single um, object in your database, just to show you a little bit how it works. So here we, we do explain match in the same query that we had before. And you can see up here that uh, it says that it's gonna touch um, 1600 objects. When we run profile, we have similar graph, but you'll see here that the number that it actually touch is uh, over 16,000 objects. Here are some useful query that I like to run. Um, and here is the uh, link to the GitHub repo that I talked about. 
And uh, the last slide of the deck is a, a link where you can download the whole deck. So you don't need, need really to take pictures of everything. Um, so what I like to do when I go into a new organization is run some information about domain user. I like to see where domain user have uh, local admin rights, if there is any path from domain uh, user to high value target, um, if domain user can RDP to any system, and then I want to check all the other rights that actually um, domain user could have. After that, it's interesting to look at Kerber hosting. For those who have no idea what Kerber hosting is, it's, a, it's an attack where you request a weak cipher of a password uh, in RC4 and you crack it offline. Um, if you want more information, you can go to adsecurity.org by Sean McAuliffe. You'll get all the information that you need. So you can easily target only the high value account first uh, or list all of the, the accounts. And those queries, uh, as I said, are, are there. And I also brought back the top 10 that were in version one uh, because I think that as a defender, they are a great place to start hunting in your environment and exploring what you have. Uh, when you get good with uh, Cypher, you can uh, do query that look like this. Uh, those two query were actually shared by uh, Andy or Waldo uh, in the Bloodhound Slack channel. But just to show you how it can become complex. So here you have optional match, we're collecting variable, we're adding them, uh, and then we're reading from them using unwind, uh, we count things, we, we do distinct count, and in the second one we're actually extracting properties, we're filtering out of them, we can do also some maths, you can see here average and length, so it can get pretty complex. If you want to learn more about Cypher, uh, there's the Neo4j uh, cheat sheet that you can go and use. So now that we know about Cypher, we're going to go and destroy some paths. So I'm just going to explain what we're trying to do exactly. So we're trying to find the busiest path that will give most of our user a path to a high value target. Then we're going to test the effect of the remediation that we want to send to our domain admins just to make sure that it actually kills the path, destroy the path for real. This way our sysadmin won't work for nothing and we won't have paths uh, when they're done fixing the problem. So we're gonna try that in a control environment first. So first of all, we're gonna create a problem. So here's how you would create a link between two objects. You use the merge command between domain user and uh, a computer that is named 673 and then you give admin rights uh, from the group to the computer. When you run that, you'll get that one relation is created. Now it's time to test your relation. So here how you would test a relationship. So you do a, a match of a path between domain user and computer 673, and then you return P or your path. And not surprisingly, here is our admin path from uh, domain user to computer 673. Now we have two options to filter out or to remove the link. First of all, we can filter it out. So this is useful when you have only one uh, link uh, one edge of that type in the whole path, or you could delete the relationship, and this is useful if you have more than one uh, type of relationship, and I'll show you an example. So now uh, this is how you would do the filter out. So it's the same beginning of the query. We're gonna match a path between domain user and computer 673, and we're gonna filter out all relation. We're gonna look at all the relationships where the relationship name is different from admin2, and then we're gonna return that path. If we want to delete the relationship, again, same beginning. So we're gonna match a path between uh, domain admin and computer 673, and then we're gonna delete the relation. And then we need to print it, so we're just gonna return the path. Here are the queries side by side, and again, not surprisingly, when you run that, you have no data. So it works. Or does it? So I realized a few days before the presentation, that everything that I just said about this theory is actually wrong. So if everything is wrong, did you actually came here for nothing? I will, I'll take you through my uh, thought process and you'll understand. So let's test it against real data. So now we wanna find our target, so we're gonna do a shortest path between domain user and domain admin and we're gonna return that path. And here is our path, and at the top here we have execute decom. And as you can see, or maybe not, I don't know if it's big enough for you, but there's no other execute decom in the path, so that should be a prime candidate for a filter out. So let's go and do that. 
So we're going to do a match, shortest path, from domain user to domain admin, where relationships are different from execute decom. If this mitigation works, we should not have a path anymore to domain admin. But we do. But now it's nine ops away. So we didn't, removing the execute decom did not actually fix the problem. Uh, so we, we need to target another link. But why is filtering wrong then? Because it clearly kind of worked. Well, if you use all shortest paths instead of shortest path, you'll see that there was actually two paths that, were, that had six ops. But with the, the interface only showed one. So here, down here, you have the execute decom that we, um, um, that we filter out. But actually, there was another execute decom in the other shortest path that was also filtered out. And this is something that I realized when I was answering a question to someone on the Bloodhound channel. Um, he was saying, how can I filter out a relationship between two objects? And someone said, just go in the GUI and un uncheck the, um, the filter that you don't want. And I say, no, this is wrong because it's going to filter that type of relationship everywhere in your database. So it's wrong. And I was very proud of my answer. And then the next morning I said, uh oh, this is exactly what I'm doing, but with Cypher. <laughs> so, so that's when I realized that I was actually wrong. So this is not a good method. Don't use filtering. It was a nice, uh, it was very nice in theory, but don't use it. So what about deleting uh, a relation? Because I said everything was wrong, right? So let's go again to our shortest path from domain user to domain admin. And now we have the label. And here is the um, execute decom is between uh, the group IT4574 and computer 652. So let's target that relationship and let's delete it. So we're going to match a path between IT group uh, 4574 and a computer name 652. And we're going to delete our relationship. Delete R. As you can see in the little brackets, there's an R. And then you get this. And then I was like, this. Because this was 36 hours before the presentation. And I was like, uh oh, I'm going to talk in front of a lot of people, and it doesn't work. Fortunately enough, the solution was one Google search away. So here is the correct way of deleting a relationship. So you need to specify which type of relation that you want to delete, and then you delete only one relationship. Sorry, here it is. Um, so now you see that we want to target a relationship that is actually named execute decom, and that will delete only one relationship. And then I was literally like this in my hotel room. <laughs> so using that technique, you'll get from the filtering that, uh, that had nine ops to the, the picture on the right, which is actually the right one, and we only deleted one execute decom, and we still have the other one as a, a shortest path. So we still know that removing that execute decom did not fix the link, but at least we, we are not blind to a lot of paths that might be shorter. So here is a little bit what happens, is that if you run the same query in the two different GUI, you'll see that in uh, Neo4j console, you, get, you see all the links. And in Bloodhound, you see only one link. And the reason is very simple, and I had a chat with, uh, with Waldo about this, is that when you query the database, it actually returns only one link, and it's going to return the first one that it sees alphabetically. So if the most important link starts with a Z, you won't see it, if there's another link that starts with a lower letter. Well, this is something that you might want to consider. Also in the, the web console, for some reason, it also returned only one, path, but it shows them all by some black voodoo magic. So let's recap a little bit what happened. First of all, a graph is like a map. So it's not because you close one street between two cities that you cannot reach that city. There's always another, well, most of the time there's another way to get there. Bloodhound will show only one relationship, even if there's more than one. And it is possible to delete a specific relationship if you give it a name. Um, also, be careful. When you start deleting relationship, uh, you need either to recreate them, or if you delete too much and you'll use track, you can reimport your old database and it's going to recreate it. Um, 
So now that uh, we've got the right, solution, the right solution, we can get back to what the presentation was about um, and go for, for pro tip number two of the talk. Hey, Scooby, will there be another fairy? Sub T. Oh, that's lovely, Casey. I, um, I won't spoil it to you, but there might be another one. Um, so here, by default, Bloodhound only have five groups that are high value. In your environment, there might be more, or there are probably more. So here's a query that will actually show you all the groups that have admin in the name and that, have, and that don't have the high value property set to true. So in this fake environment, here are what we have. We have Asia admin, Europe admin, and North America admin. You can use this query here, it's the same beginning, but then you can set the, the I value property of those groups to true, and now all of your important groups are I value. So it's gonna change from the five dif uh, default one to the eight groups that are actually important in your environment. Pro tip number three, um, it's nice that you have all the groups that are high value, but what about their members? So this query will, will query all the groups that have high value, and then set the I value of all of the user to true. I'm not sure why uh, it's not done by default, uh, but it's not. For those who have a good eye, you might have noticed that the relationship in this one is actually reverse. Um, this is just, again, to show you how flexible Cypher can be. So it's gonna change, visually, it's gonna change your graph from this. This is domain admin and all the admin uh, domain admins in the group to this where everyone has his little diamond, meaning that they high value target. When you run this in your environment, what it's gonna look like, if you run the all shortest paths to high value targets, it's gonna get from this originally to this. So you can see that there's actually a lot more high value targets that exist in your environment than what was shown originally. Now it's time for pro tip number four, and I know, I know, it's not Christmas, but I keep on giving. So here is a way to improve some of your query, and this is a, a tool in the, um, in the shell, as you can see, and we're gonna come back to that tool later, but it's just to show you exactly how long it takes to run every query. Um, so in the first one, you can see that it's slightly uh, longer than the second one, and there's a very slight difference. In the first one, you are returning a path, and in the second one, you are returning a property. And it is a lot faster to return properties than it is to return path. So if you don't need the full path, just return the property that you are interested in. Again, my database is small. On a bigger database, it's gonna make a bigger impact. Another pro tip to speed up the process is that you, uh, and there's again a very subtle difference between those two queries, and it's right here. In the first one, we are defining a variable to our relationship, whereas in the second one, we do not. So if you don't plan to do anything with the relationship, you don't need to actually uh, put a variable. And I see some people nodding. Um, if you want to learn more about Bloodhound and how to use it as a defender, there was a good talk by the Spectre Ops crew called Operationalizing Bloodhound Attack Graph for Defense. This is the link. Sad Processor also did some research. Uh, in the first link, he explained how he whitelist nodes using uh, some properties. And in the second link, it's actually some Cypher queries and uh, Cypher training uh, specifically for Bloodhound. There's also obviously the Bloodhound Slack, especially the Cypher query channel, uh, whereas lots of people are active and will help you build your queries. Now it's time to talk about reporting because attackers thinks in graph, management thinks in metrics, and as long as this is true, ops will suffer. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank uh, Sad Processor uh, for being the originator of this. <laughs> so, um, so here's an example of very basic reports that you could give your organization, and I've highlighted two of the query that we're gonna go a little bit deeper. Uh, so first of all, the percentage of user with a path to domain admin. Let's say the first time you run this in January, you have 100%. Then you manage to get it down to 57 and maybe to 12 percent. Uh, if this is not um, graphical enough uh, or visual enough, sorry, for your management, you can always use gauges. <laughs> and if this is not 
visual enough, well, honestly, I cannot help you anymore. Um, these ones have been made very, very easily with Google Docs. So here's the query that you can use to show the percentage of users who have a path to domain user. So this query goes, um, I'm gonna try to explain it a little bit. So you, you're doing an optional match where you are looking for user that have a path to domain admin. Then you're doing another match where you're looking for the, the total of user and you count them, you count the distinct number of user you have and you put that in a variable that you call uTotal. Um, and then you, you count, you count uh, also the distinct user that has a path. And then you do some maths right in your return function. So you say user that has a path divided by my total user multiplied by 100%, they will give me my percent. So here you have it, 100%, uh, which is pretty normal because I've created the link for that. Um, and now the second uh, query that I want to show, and this one I'm also very proud of because I worked very, very hard. Um, Waldo gave me a, a, a query that worked in production using SID, but it didn't work in my test database because there's no uh, SID in the fake database. Uh, so I had to work kind of hard to, to make this one. Um, so here it, it goes. So you do an optional match for computer that are not in the domain controller group. So that will give you all your non-domain controller machine and you can see it as non-DC. And then you're gonna do a match from all of your computer that are not DC and you're gonna search for all the user that have a session on those machines that, uh, that are member of the domain admin groups. And then you're gonna return the, all the username and you're gonna count uh, to how many machines they are connected to and you're gonna return that. Again, for those who have good eyes, you might have noticed that here we have double relationship, again, showing how powerful Cypher can be when you start playing with it and understand how it works. So this will give us something like this. So all the username and all the number, the number of connection they have. So now you know who you can target in your organization to give some training and explain how it works. If you have more cryptic username and this doesn't mean anything to you, there's a little neat trick here. You'll see this is pretty much the same query that I've just shown. There's a slight difference is that in the return function, we use brackets, and this way we can return more than one attributes. So that will return something that looks like this. So we have the username and then the display name uh, from the database. Now again, another way to be more visual maybe is to use a logarithmic uh, view or logarithmic bars. This is probably not the best way to show it, but it's, it's difficult. Um, because lots of, like if you're looking especially for Kerberos thing, you'll have very large number and for the rest you should have very small number. Um, but I hope I get some points because I've used a dark team. Ho! Oh, the third fairy of the, of the talk. Now it's time to talk about automation. Because let's be honest, we don't like to do things again and again and again. So here we're back in the shell uh, and there's this uh, Cypher shell utility that is located in the bin directory. So you can export your username, export your password, and then you can paste your Cypher query right in the shell. Uh, so this query, for example, is actually, you're looking for a high value um, curb roastable accounts that are member of high value groups. When you run that in the shell, this is what you get. Uh, very nice graph. You can also pipe that into a CSV and that will give you something like that. Someone asked me the other day why Q8, it's just because it's the eighth query uh, in my graph. Um, and then this, you can, yeah, you can put in a CSV and everybody can open a CSV, even your management. Uh, so you can easily pass them around. Now it's time to do some alerting. So when, oh yeah, I forgot a little pro tip. I'm just gonna come back. As you can see here, uh, we need to put the query in single quotes. So it's a good habit to use always double quotes when you're, when you're building your query and use single quotes in the, uh, in the shell or the other way around. You can use single quotes everywhere, but don't mix and match single quotes and double quotes when dealing with strings because otherwise it's gonna make your automation extremely difficult. So alerting. So you wanna do, uh, you wanna build your query as, I, as you saw, and then you wanna keep the result from the previous month and you wanna compare the result. And if the number increase, you probably wanna generate a ticket to your SOC. If there's more curb roastable accounts in the high value group, 
you want to investigate why, you want to reach out to the, the, the owner of those groups and see if it's really mandatory that those users are in high value groups. Um, yeah. Now it's time for the conclusion. So here are the key takeaways for the talk. With a tool like Bloodhound, defenders can start thinking in graph too. Um, Cypher, as I think I've demonstrated, is a very flexible and powerful language. It is also important to test the real impact of a remediation that you want to do in your in your te or in your in your database. This way, you're not going to talk with your admin, tell them, "Hey, delete this link or remove this group from or remove that person from that group or remove these properties," and then you run it next month and you have the exact same number of user that have a path to domain admin. If you do that. Uh, one time, it's maybe okay. If you do that a second time, a third time, um, your sysadmin will lose faith in blood down. They'll lose faith in the process. And more importantly, they might lose faith in you. So always test the, the effect. Also, not all queries are worth automating. For example, uh, the first query that we saw was actually all the domain admins in all the user in the domain admin groups. And this is something that you should definitely monitor, but you're gonna run blood down maybe once a month, once a week if you're lucky, uh, but you probably wanna be informed right away in real time if there's a new domain admin in your enterprise. So you're way better using uh, event, Windows Event ID 4728 instead of Bloodhound for alerting for that. It's time for the thank yous. So I wanna thank uh, DerbyCon for allowing me to be here today. I wanna thank uh, Sean McAlf, Tal Berry, and Grifter for inspiring me to submit talks uh, and come here today and talk to you publicly. And of course, I wanna thank Waldo and Captain Jesus for the great work they've done to the community, all the support they're giving every day to everyone. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, this is the, the link, as I promised, where you can download uh, the, the whole deck. Uh, do we have time for question? Do we have time for questions? Yeah? Seven minutes. So anyone has a question? Yes? <laughs> it's honestly too warm. <laughs> Seems like, any other question? Okay. So, okay. The question was, do I find a need to add stuff in the graph using merge? Usually, no. Usually, it's you import the data. Unless you delete a relationship and you want to recreate it, then you would use a merge. Any other questions? Yes. A pro tip for running the ingester, well, I would suggest that you uh, run it as a normal user first, uh, just to get the, it's easier to get the buy-in of your corporation if you run it as a, as a normal user. And once you think you've reached um, a point where you cannot improve anymore, then you can ask to, to run it as a, as a local admin on all machines, and then it's gonna open new doors and new possibility. Any other questions? Yes? And the question is, uh, when do I think a domain is too large for blood and to handle? I don't have the questions, but you might ask these two guys right here. They might be able to answer. Yes. One last question maybe before everybody leaves. <laughs>